Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Repair Cafe. I'm Don Fick, your host for the next hour or so as we explore the world of repair. Normally, a Repair Cafe is an in-person workshop where local repair coaches help area residents repair common household items. In the process, everyone learns new skills, saves a little money, and helps to break the cycle of throw away and buy new. But during the pandemic, repair groups around the world are working hard to keep the spirit of repair alive. And um, we're doing that here via these Zoom events. And so if you've been to a repair cafe before, welcome back. And if you haven't, well, you're gonna have a, a little bit of experience tonight, seeing the kind of excitement, curiosity, and satisfaction that occurs at repair cafe events in person. So uh, during this Zoom-based event, we're doing the uh, we're using the webinar package, which will um, keep the video and audio for most of our guests off the screen, and you'll see our coaches on screen as we uh, discuss topics. And as the show goes on, we'll ask you to raise your hand to contribute your own repair project and ask questions. We also uh, do have a chat feature that's available through the software that you can use to contribute comments throughout uh, the program and we can try to incorporate those in our discussion. Um, it's also a great way to share links and other helpful information. Um, this is the first of our summer series of special presentations. To, we're going to be seeing from Tom Karchus in a few minutes, um, tricks and techniques for cracking open difficult cases. So after you've removed all the screws and you still can't get in, Tom's gonna show us a few tricks on how you can still be victorious in opening that box. Or no screws. And, uh, and then on August 3rd, Cheryl Warren and Becca Hunter will explore the basics of sewing machine maintenance, understanding how to properly lubricate and, uh, and maintain those machines so they provide you years of good use. And later in August on the 19th, Kathy Murphy will explain tools and techniques of basic jewelry repair. Anyone is welcome to attend any of these events. Um, you can register and get more information about them by visiting repaircafe.tv. And, um, and so uh, we've got um, about 13 people in the audience. We have some of our coaches have joined. And so um, Tom, if you're ready, we're going to hand it over to you. And Tom will uh, tell us a bit about the, um, the kinds of cases he's going to crack for us. Okay, well, thanks, Don. Um, I've been taking, apart stuff, taking, it, taking stuff apart for a long, long time. And sometimes you'll run into stuff where there are no screws or the screws are hidden or, uh, uh, and you, you, know, you go, well, I guess I can't get in. Well, it turns out you can. It just takes a little bit of extra work. Um, one, one good example is a remote. It is a Samsung remote. There are no visible screws anywhere on this remote, but clearly somebody put it together. So there's a way to take it apart. Uh, so some devices will just have like, will be like this remote will have no screws. Some will have, and I'm going to bring up a TV in a minute that has some screws and some clips. I call them clips. So basically the way these are put together is that there's, um, it's like a catch system where you have a, a piece on the top, plastic that catches with the bottom. So you can basically snap it together. If I could just snap there. And you can't just pull it apart. So what I use, and I'll mention these things later, is um, my, my best tool is something from iFixit. It's called a Jimmy. It's a very thin, pretty strong steel tool. Especially on smaller devices, you need to have something really stiff because these are really difficult to get open. So, but it's just a, I'll show you tech, some techniques for getting these things apart. I'm gonna switch to my, I'm gonna switch to my other camera here. You wanna see what I'm doing. So, so what I would do with this, first I would, I would look at it and kind of try to figure out where the seam was. And on, and on this one, it seemed to me the best place to, to come in would be in the back between this piece of plastic here and this piece of plastic. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this Jimmy tool and basically just gonna get it in that crack as best I can. This is the hardest part, getting in when you've, you've got nothing. And unfortunately, you just have to have a good feel for this, but you're gonna basically twist it till you hear a pop. So now if you look at it now, there's actually a seam. I can actually see into the device now. So I'm gonna work my way around the device and I'm gonna basically bend up to pop, to pop the, 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 the catches. So there's another one popped. Come on. I'm just moving down the length of the device 
to the net wherever the next uh, snap is. Now pop that one. You can hear them popping. I'll go around to the other side, do the same thing. And I'll show you what these look like when I get it apart. And you can, then you, it's pretty clear what's going on. I practiced with these last night, so I knew I could get them apart. So we're just going to work our way down the length of the, and just sometimes uh, cell phones will be put together this way also. Just any kind of small device that can, it would need to be assembled like in a hurry or something inex really inexpensive. So I've got enough of these catches popped. So now, down to the last end. All right, got it apart. So if you look, you see these little plastic things right there and there and there. There's like little nubs. And on the other end, on the, the remote side, there are little grooves where, these, where those nubs catch when it goes together. Uh, you may wonder, why would I want to take a remote control apart? Well, one thing you will find with some remotes, depending on who's in your house, is that certain buttons will stop working. And so what I do is have to do sometimes if a remote's not working, I'll take it apart. I'll remove the rubber buttons and get some alcohol and just clean these pads really good. These are actually like switches. They're inside your remote. And some people seem to have a lot really oily hands. And I've, I've opened these up and had like oil be all over the, 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 the button pad, which is bizarre to me. But, but you clean that up and you just reverse your process. Put, put, the, um, put the button tabs back on and reassemble. And usually it's good as new. So I've done a few of those. And I'll show you how you put it back together. It's actually easier. So Tom, I'm curious when you um, are starting to crack open the case and the um, there's a lot of resistance, how do you know when you're maybe trying too hard or how do you have the confidence to, to try a little harder? That's a hard one sometimes. I think it's one of those, it's one, this is one of those things where it's, it's, it's really a matter of having, having, some experience, having some experience with it. I would suggest you wanna practice, practice on an old remote for a TV that you no longer have or just some other device where you don't really care about it and practice on it. In most cases, the worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna break off some of the tabs or you're gonna, you're gonna mar the side of the case, uh, which in, in most cases is not a big deal. The, the worst ones are where you, it's all held together with clips and then there's like one screw and it's hidden under something. And those, those can be kind of a problem, obviously. Um, but it's really just a matter of you get in there and you work your way down and you basically you're just gonna pry it. And I hate to say you can tell, but you probably will be able to tell whether you're, you're going a little too far and whether you should try prying in a different direction or, or working at it a little differently. It's, it's kind of difficult to describe, but the main thing is you want to find a seam to get in and then work your way around it. Uh, so I'm going to put this back together. Basically, it's going to line this all up and then just squeeze it shut. There we go. And Tom, was it important to uh, take the batteries out before you started to do this? Uh, well, I had no batteries in it, but yeah. Okay. It, it, actually, that's probably good because the contacts, the spring contacts are actually attached to the board. Hmm. So um, actually, another reason you might want to take these apart is if your batteries leak. And I actually had one of these a, a couple of days ago where the batteries had leaked in it, and I wanted to clean out all the, all the debris from the uh, battery acid. So taking it apart, it, then you can soak the case or clean it under the, under the sink and not worry about getting the electronics all wet. And uh, so I did that and cleaned it up. So that's, this is a little, these are sometimes the hardest. I wanna show another one that's, how much time do I have? You have um, as much time as you'd like. Okay. Figure, figure you know, another right. 15 minutes. I'm gonna minutes. show you three different things. <clears throat> So 
So this, I'll show you the other view. This is a Dell, mon Dell computer monitor. When you open it up, take the back off, there's four screws on the back here, but it turns out those are for mounting brackets. There are no other screws on this device anywhere. This one is actually kind of unusual in that, uh, oh, I mean that, hit the wrong button. On this one, the seam is actually around the top and not around the side. And this is a case where a lot of times you look at these things and you, and you, you think the seam is in a, you think the seam is in a certain spot, like here. Well, the seam is not there. The seam is on the top. And this is a case where you, when you get something, you have to, you have to sort of inspect it and figure out where you can actually get uh, a, your, your blade in, into the system. Because it's, I've had a number of cases where it was really difficult to tell <clears throat> where to go. One thing I would say on larger devices like this, the best place to go in is on a really wide, on the wider side of it. The closer you are to the corners, the harder it's going to be to pull it up. So you're going to be best off in the middle. So I'm going to get my tool in here and work it. So I've got it in there. I'm going to pop. Actually, I'm going to turn it toward me. Now I'll turn it around to show you what I'm doing. So one thing you also may want to do is uh, in some of these devices, especially when they're smaller, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll get, you'll get one side open. And if you set it down the wrong way, it will actually snap back shut again. So uh, I fix it includes with their toolkit these little picks. And sometimes what you want to do is you, once you've worked your way down to a certain part, you'll insert one of these picks in there to hold it to keep it from snapping back shut on you. It's almost exactly the same as a guitar pick, isn't it? It basically could be a guitar pick. And they're super handy. Or, or if you have guitar picks around, you can use You can them. just use guitar picks then. You want really thin ones though. So I'm gonna work my way around here. Now with uh, monitors, the thing you really have to watch out for is that usually the piece that comes off is gonna have the controls in it with the buttons where you actually turn it off or change the volume. And you want to be really careful when you take it apart that you, um, I'm just working my way around. And you can see there's the half of the clip on the top with the three holes. And on the inside, there's three holes that match up with that. So here's where my controls are. So I want to be really careful when I start to pop that loose because I don't want to uh, damage the, the cable. Then it will be totally useless. So I'm going to pop this. This actually, I took this apart yesterday again to make sure I could do it again. And this, is, this one's been taken apart multiple times. So yours may not be as easy. And again, here, I'm going to find the best place to go in is on, is on the uh, outer edge, usually. Yeah. Or I can just, sometimes you can just pull it up. And again, this is something where you don't want to bend the plastic but you can give it a certain amount of pull before it will, it will, it will break. And you, you usually look better with a kind of a jerky motion. You want to jerk it. You don't want to pull it gradually. So you want to pop the steps loose. So I got this loose. It turns out on this one, the way it comes out is you actually turn it over and dump it out. It's kind of bizarre. So got that case off. And then you would just, do whatever you needed to do in here, and then basically reverse your process, putting the back back on. And again, it, all you do is just squeeze the, squeeze the edges back in until everything snaps back together. So that's kind of a different one. Again, this, this, show, this goes to show you that 
you need to really pay attention to how it's put together and be sure that you're really actually prying in the right place. Because if you're not, you're going to mess something up. At least you're going to mess the plastic up. <clears throat> Final one. And I've already taken the screws out. This is a little Samsung TV set. And this one has some screws on it. There were four screws, one in the corner here, and two along the side, and one on the bottom here. But those are the, and there's actually one in the top here. And here's another thing to notice, when you're taking things apart, notice that next to this, uh, where the screw hole is, there's an arrow. This is a really common way that the manufacturers in indicate which screws have to come out in order to remove the back. There'll generally always be an arrow next to them. Even, even by all these screws here, there's little arrows next to where the screws are. So you know where the, where the fasteners actually are, which is kind of nice. So once you get those all off with this one, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm lucky with this one in that I've actually gotten four of the screws out. I know I can probably, my best way to go in is to come in from the side where I took the screws out, obviously, because that will be easier. I'm gonna take this base off. So again, I'm just gonna use my pry tool. And one nice thing is now, since this has screws, I've actually got a nice gap here already going. I don't even have to pry from this side. So now I'm just gonna work my way over to the other sides, get it under there. Tom, if you could lower it down a little bit toward right. the camera. Yeah, yeah so I'm gonna basically work my way, you hear the pop. So I move to the next corner. Uh, I can see it. Uh, this one this wasn't one. To, wasn't too a different. This is typically the kind you're going to find. Not like the one in there when the, when the, where the way the front was is really in, in, in a different way, but this is typically what you're going to find something where the, the front snaps right onto it and you'll have a whole big, big bezel come off. The bezel being the, the, the ring on the front that goes in front of the screen. And that's, what, that's going to be what you remove to get to, get to the insides. And I don't know why I'm nervous. I've done this a million times. I can probably suggest um, you may want to put a towel down or something to uh, soften yeah. your work surface. Oh yeah, that would be um, a good idea. Yeah, so. what, do, what Don said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get all excited and I forget. But, um. That's a good idea. Put put a towel down, then you can actually move around, and you can not worry so much about. But as as Don will tell you, I, I tend to get kind of enthusiastic about things like this. When somebody brings something in, I get all excited, and I don't want I, I don't want to take precautions. I want to go in, and I was I want to take it apart. I'm usually the one who's chasing people down to uh, sign right. off on their registration paperwork. Right. So there, that one. I just did a pry on the top to pop that off. And this is what, and one thing I'll actually point out now, an extra added bonus, one of the main reasons you would take a TV apart is because it stopped working. And one thing I noticed on this one, I'll see if you can see, you can see it. If you can see this component right there, this capacitor, it's hard to tell, but most of these capacitors, they call capacitors, have a very flat top. And this top is bulging on this one a little bit, which tells you this part is going bad. And usually the way this exhibits itself is the TV will just stop working. So since I took this apart, I'm gonna go ahead and replace the part while I'm at it. Um, some Samsung TVs I've had six or seven capacitors I had to replace 
to get it working again. And um, this is a real common problem. But this can be the difference between, you know, having a, an $800 doorstop, your flat screen TV that doesn't come on anymore, and having something that's working. So, um, <clears throat> so Tom, in, in the case of maybe replacing a capacitor, um, if folks don't feel capable of maybe, you know, soldering and, and sure. removing individual components, is it possible to replace the entire power supply there? Um, what, if, one thing you can do with that is, uh, let, me, let me flip my camera back up again, is I've actually recommended this to some people, is there's a whole market of people who, are, who, who get these old TVs with like broken screens and they part them out. And then they test the parts. So what you're gonna, you can actually go on a place like eBay and you can find the, find the model number on this board, wherever it is. See if I can find it, but you'll be a model number on the, on, the part, on the power supply board. And also you'll go by the model number of the TV and do a search on like eBay and people will sell, they will sell you a replacement power supply board. And what that includes is you, you, have, you have to ship them your board and then they ship you a working board back. And then once you do that, it's really just a matter of once you have the good board, it's just a matter of disconnecting these wires here. There's one, two, two wires going on and then taking two screws out, pulling the board out and then dropping it back in. I will say also versus old TV sets, these don't really, those, these don't really hold any volt, hold any voltage. I think with, with older TVs, I, you would warn people not to get into old TVs because they were dangerous right. because they actually were. But the, these modern TVs, the, the charge will be pretty much gone by the time you get it open. And unless, unless you're poking around with a metal device, if you're just getting in there with your hands and unscrewing, generally I think you're pretty safe though. Again, your mileage may vary and I'm not guaranteeing you that everything will go as planned. But in my experience is that this is a relatively safe thing to do. Uh, the worst thing that usually can happen is you end up breaking the screen in, in the process of trying to get it apart and then you don't have anything. But, um, so there's that one. And that's actually all I plan to do. Yeah, I think that's had... great. That was a, a really good selection of, of case cracking there, Tom. Um, yeah. in, in the chat, some folks have asked a few questions about the specialized tools. Um, you mentioned iFixit and the Jimmy tool. Yeah. <laughs> Hold that up again. We could take a look at that. And you mentioned the uh, the little triangular pick. That, yeah, the Jimmy um, tool. I, I've actually got this on my um on my in my browser. The Jimmy you can actually buy the Jimmy tool. It's like eight dollars for the Jimmy tool. And the the, the picks comes with six or four dollars. But what I would do, if you're going to be doing think you're going to be doing any of this, is they sell a really nice kit. And this is what I mostly use. It's 25 bucks. And you know, it has basically, you can, you can re uh, replace a phone battery with this kit. So you've got, you get your, your uh, Jimmy tool and you've got your picks. You've also got some tweezers. Here's another prying tool, which you would typically use on smaller devices. This typically doesn't work on these because it's just not strong enough. And of course you got all the screwdrivers you need. And so if you're gonna buy the Jimmy tool and you're gonna buy the picks, You've already spent eleven dollars already, so you might as well, you know, spend another ten ten dollars and get the whole kit, and then you'll have something you can use for a long time. <clears throat> but um, I've tried using things like knives, but I've never really been able to try to find one that's thin enough to get in there um, and be stiff enough to where I can actually pop it, but but thin enough to actually get inside the crack. So it's um, it's um, I've I found this works the best. <clears throat> So we'd like to give our guests an opportunity to ask Tom any uh, specific questions about cracking open cases. If you'd like to, you can raise your hand and we'll turn on your audio. Um, there is an option in the software to uh, click raise hand. Um, you'll see that probably along the bottom, it might be hidden by the more menu if you click on that. Um, or uh, it depends on the specific software if you're using desktop or phone software. Nobody else. Oh, we do have a question. Um, Fred, would you uh, like to ask Tom a question? Um, well, I guess the, the, it's a general question. Are, are the re I see that you're recording this, which is wonderful. Is the recording link going to be made available to us? 
Yes, we do post our recordings at repaircafe.tv. There's a menu item for videos, and you'll be able to see that. It'll be uh, streaming available on YouTube. We also uh, make this available right now live on Facebook. Great. Uh, can you just have to post that in the chat for us, please? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Thanks. And um, you have any other questions, Fred? Uh, no, that, that's well, not yet. <laughs> okay, thanks. I think the main thing is, is that, you know, practice on something that's already broken. Because um, you obviously, if it's already broken, there's nothing more thing to go wrong with it. And, you know, before you throw something out, try to get it apart first. Because, any, because I found that, that just taking things apart in general is good practice for repairing things later. And I always figure it, it's really interesting. It's kind of a discovery process. You learn, you learn as you go. And every time you take something apart or do something, you learn a little bit more. And then the next time you go in, you have all those additional things you know or the experiences you have that generally, generally tend to make it go a lot better even the next time. So it's one of those things you kind of have to practice to get to where you're comfortable doing it. And um, Peter, um, do you have a uh, question for Tom? Uh, let's see, there you go, Peter. A lot of things these days are plastic welded. The two things that come to mind immediately are like transformers and power supplies, like the MacBook power supplies. Yeah. And so you, you'll see a seam, you'll try to put your jimmy in there, mm. but it ain't coming apart. Now, I, now I've, fixed, I've fixed MacBook power supplies before. And the trick with those is, is that um, you should look this up. There's a method by which you use a pair of pliers to crack them open. And what you do is you use the pliers in the exact opposite way you would expect. You actually stick the pliers down inside the supply and you pull the handles apart, which causes the jaws to come apart to pop the case. So um, I would go look online because there's people that show you how to do that. And that method works pretty well. You may have, though, have to, you may have to weaken, use like a saw to weaken the seam uh, to make it come apart. But I've had pretty good luck with, with the pliers method. And if uh, you know how the ears flip out on the, on the supply, it basically the pliers go right in that hole there where the ear flips out. Hey, thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. And um, Dennis, you have a uh, question. Yeah, it's more of a, a comment. Another thing to look for when you're cracking cases is if there's a label uh, on the outside. You can sometimes there are screws under labels, and right. the way to check that is you press with your finger or thumb over the label, and you'll feel a little indentation where the screw would be. You know, you have to kind of punch through that to get to the screw. Also, if you're working on something that has little rubber feet under it, uh, for instance, like a laptop, right. often screws are under those little rubber feet. And that's all I have. And one thing I will say also, and he's, he's right, and that's, that's, the, that's the other secret part of getting things open. But one thing, here's another remote, and notice on the back of it, there's a label. And if I feel along this label, oh, there's a bump there. And I, if, I, if you pop this up, it's not actually a screw. It's basically a, it's just the remains of the manufacturing process. So it's like, it, it's not even a screw hole. Like so there's, you, get, you get tricked get, get tricked by, by that. But yeah, always look under the feet. The rubber feet usually come out relatively easy. And um, I had, I can't, I wish I had it. There was one where I got all the screws out but one and it was, it was hidden under a piece of molding. It was bizarre. I mean, it was like, it was almost like they purposely tried to hide the screw. It took me like a half hour to figure out where the, where the screw was, but um, hopefully, usually they're not that bad. Again, again, the, oh, one thing, I, one thing I also want to mention with the clips is what I sometimes do is if I have something that I think I may want to take apart again, is that I'll go into, I'll go on the back of the, the device, and this isn't a good example. If you, if you remember on the remote, there's a pieces that stuck out or on some TVs, <clears throat> excuse me, is I'll actually go through and I'll actually break off like every other one of the clips. And then I'll mark them, and then I'll mark the ones on the outside that I still have, like with a black Sharpie. So I, if, if it has like six clips along the side, I may go break off every other one and then mark the ones with black Sharpie that are still there. So if I need to go back in, I just pop those two that's left. Because usually there's way more clips than it needs to hold it together. Especially there's also screws. Okay, Dennis, any other questions? No, thank you. Okay, thanks. And um, and let's see, and sorry, you know, sometimes I bungle the software here. Peter, did you have another question or did I make a mistake? 
No? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, Sorry, great. I should lower my hand. Okay. No, it's all right. Yeah, I can do that too. So, um, okay. So if um, nobody has any other questions for Tom, then we're going to um, open up our uh, show for sort of general project question and answer um, and invite all of our coaches to um, be available to, uh, to provide any input or suggestions. So we're just going to uh, juggle things around a little bit here. And uh, I'd like to make a comment on Tom's presentation, if I could. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tom, that uh, Dell computer monitor you had, yeah. I have this same model, which had a bad <laughs> capacitor in it. It took me an hour to figure out how to get that thing open. But once I did, the capacitor was easy to replace, and four years later, it's still working. Right. That's another good, another good thing to learn, um, to practice with, is to learn to solder and learn to remove parts. I remember when my, when my, young, when my youngest son was 13 years old, I showed him how to do it, and a half hour later, he was doing it better than me. So uh, it's, it's not a difficult skill to learn. It's just mainly a matter of doing it the right way. So I've got a comment here. Chuck joining the. Hey, Chuck. Hey, uh, things like uh, transformers that uh, I made a comment to um, <clears throat> in the chat, but uh, things like transformers, I've had pretty good luck with just uh, putting the the transformer body um, case body into a vise uh, right aligned with the the seams so that you're pressing against you know, if the seam is running around the circumference you press against that and even maybe turn it 90 and, and they generally yield with not too much pressure and then you can bring them apart and uh, and you just uh, fix whatever's inside, you know, a, a broken solder joint or something. And uh, I'll just super glue them back together. Uh, you know, wrap, wrap them with rubber bands and super glue it back together. So there, there are lots of ways into things. So. Okay, so if, um, if any of our guests would like to ask general repair questions on pretty much any repair topic, um, we'd be happy to, uh, to ask you to join in. Um, if you just uh, likewise use the raise hand feature and we'll invite you to present your project. And um, I have a few uh, case cracking tools I brought along just for fun here. These are a little bit larger than uh, Tom's tools. A lot of times I find it important to get inside the door of my car and um, <laughs> If I'm uh, replacing a, a window regulator or um, maybe uh, fixing an electrical problem in the door. And so, if, you know, a lot of the same uh, techniques apply, but the tools are just a little bigger. And um, these are great for being able to get behind the door panel and popping those hidden connectors. And um, I think I bought a set of these, about six different types from Harbor Freight, which is a good source of inexpensive tools. Um, and this allows you to slide in and then Put a little leverage in those hidden connectors and pop the door panel open when you're upgrading your uh, stereo system or uh, repairing uh, the electric locks or door switches. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of some some fun little plastic spudgers that are just a little bit larger than your cell phone. It's it's a good place to go. I had a I had we bought a uh, couch from IKEA, and you had you used the screws that go in, and on one of the screw holes there was a solder blob. It covered over part of the hole. And Ikea was three hours away. Mm. So I ended up buying a tap and die set to tap out the hole that it was covered with the solder blob. So that was 20 bucks. So that was, a, that was well, worth the, well worth the 20 bucks. Sometimes they're not the best tools, but they'll get you by and they'll get you, you know, through a repair, so. That's right, yeah, and, then, and now you've got the tool. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, every, every project is an opportunity for a new tool. <laughs> <laughs> so do any of our uh, guests have uh, any repair questions for our coaches? Um, okay, we're uh, okay. Susan, um, you have a question for our coaches. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yep. can. Okay, it worked. <laughs> the thing came up. Um, is it possible to get a, a battery replacement for like a th 2012 MacBook, and where would I find one? 
Mine, yeah, mine swelled up, so I took it out. <laughs> Can you describe that again? What was it for? <clears throat> a 2012 MacBook. And is it a oh, 13, MacBook. 13 yeah. inch or a 15 inch MacBook? 13. 13 inch. Um, now, when you, you took it out, you opened up the case in order to get it out, right? No, it just, no, it just came out. There's a little the, thing. You just pop it out. You didn't uh, have to open it. The older ones had tabs where you popped them. You just put a, like, a, like a quarter in and turned it and it yeah. popped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it came right out, you, but it was you, swollen. It was yeah, there, there swollen. are third there are third party pla uh, places online where you can buy replacements. Okay, like like on um, and, and, you know, for things like that, I really prefer eBay to Amazon because I've gotten okay. I've gotten some fake stuff from Amazon. Not to say it's all fake, but I think you're you you're you have much better. I think you're, with eBay, you're a little better off because you can give them bad you can give them a bad review. If they oh. so you so at least and a lot of sellers, if you try to find a seller with really high rating like ninety eight percent, typically they're not going to sell you any junk because they don't want to lose their ninety eight percent rating. Oh, okay. And find a place that just you know ma matched up with the model number of the MacBook, and um, find a replacement. I would like I said eBay is where I would search, and it's just search on the model number, and and uh, you want to basically ma basically match it up, and make sure you get you got the right one, and go ahead and try that. Okay, and thank you. If you can find it on eBay, there's a, another dealer that I've, I've bought a lot of batteries from. It's batteriesamerica.com. Okay. It's all one word, Batteries America. They have replacement batteries for anything you can think of. Okay. I'm gonna go right. Pardon? They, they may be a little bit more pricey than eBay, but you can be sure that the quality will be good. Okay. That's a good job. Okay. okay. Thank yeah, you. The, um, I, I would suggest that you definitely try to buy slightly more expensive than the cheapest battery. Um, in my experience with the MacBooks, a slight misfit or a slightly swollen battery will prevent your trackpad from working. You may have oh, to dear. be clicking <laughs> down on it. Okay. And um, yeah, so fit in that is really precise. And so, you know, trying to get a, something close to a first quality battery is, is a good choice. Um, I fix it is likely a, a source of batteries as, all, as well. And, um, and there are some online retailers that specialize in Macintosh parts. Um, you might try uh, MacSales.com is one that I've purchased parts from as well. Another option, if depending on how often you, you, you're portable with it, is to just plug, it, plug in the power supply and just use it on your desk. Yeah, I've done, I've done that. But it is so nice to be able to just carry it over right. to the recliner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just be comfortable with the battery. <laughs> Okay, was it the question? Was it Batteries America or Batteries of America? One of the things you suggested. It's, it's Batteries America. There's no okay. O's in the middle. Okay. And then MaxSales.com, and maybe I fix it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Appreciate thanks, it. Susan. And um, we're going to uh, let's see. We're going to invite. Um, Fred to, uh, to ask a question. Fred, are you there? I am. Um, so I, uh, I have, have an Asus Chromebook and the screen, you know, if you open it up more than 45 degree angle, it would start to just flicker. And so I went to YouTube and they tell you how to replace the screen, but I just knew that wasn't the problem. But I went through and took it all apart <clears throat> to use some of the same techniques, pardon me, <clears throat> that you were describing and verified that um, what it really is, is a broken connector wire, <laughs> which is not, there's no part for that. Um, and it's just soldered directly to the motherboard. Do you have any suggestion? I mean, I'm just about to say, it's an old one. I was just gonna just say, well, I'm done with it, but what would you recommend? So does it work otherwise? Yeah, it works otherwise. I mean, if I hold it at a 45 degree angle, if I just raise it a little bit, I can, I can type if I put my head down and see it, but that's not a comfortable way to operate it. <laughs> right. So, Were you able to see, get it apart enough to where you can see where it's actually broken or where the problem is? Well, I just know it's, it, it's, it's somewhere in the wire that's, um, I can't remember, I think the wire is actually part of the, of the, um, 
it's not it, it's connectorized so you can take the, the screen off so it's not part of the wire it's not part of the screen okay the display itself i so i don't want to i mean the display itself is fine i'm convinced it's just it's because right. when i when i would i just left it open i would bend it and i could see exactly what was going on right you know, it, it could be i mean it could be where it where it connects into the uh the main board where where the wire comes in uh, it, it's, it's really hard to know exactly what's going on until I, you actually get to the point where you can see it and sometimes I, 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 I think it's where i think it's being i think it's been flexed just one too many times so i think it's fatigue failed in the middle of the wire somewhere um so i'd have to figure out a way to trace the wire back make sure i get all the connections right and i'm just not sure I want to now what you that. can do is if, you, if if it's a flex cable and it's broken and assuming the wire is not too small you sometimes you can solder in another wire basically in parallel where it used to run to make to make the connection again that can be a little dodgy when you have really really small circuits but sometimes that works yeah well i, I may do that because i otherwise I, I mean before i give it back to best buy to recycle i thought i'd mess with or it or so. another thing <laughs> is that is that just, just take the lid off completely and turn it into a desktop computer yeah, well yeah. and give it to I, somebody I, here yeah. you're hook a monitor to it and a keyboard and here you go yeah, that's a good good point. I mean, I used to use it for pre presentation, so I needed to travel with it. Oh, but, um, yeah. But I'm not doing a lot of that anyway these days, so I guess it might be a bad, a good idea. So, but thanks. I'll uh, I'll look into that. Sure. And Fred, in the uh, in the chat, there were a couple uh, suggestions, um, possibility of of being able to purchase a replacement cable from was it from Asus that the left that the Chromebook was from? Uh, yeah, I'd have to. Um, See, am, so I, it, am I still muted or okay? No. Um, yeah, Asus says uh, when I report the problem, they just said thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like uh, like Tom mentioned earlier about buying power supply parts. Sometimes yeah. in the aftermarket of eBay and other places, you can find uh, folks who have stripped things down. And they're that's offering true. those. You yeah, know, that, that's I, I could do that. Yeah, but you know, for a hundred bucks, I could get a brand new one. <laughs> Right, that's what they that's what they think. I, I yeah. had my fl flat screen go out after, right after the warranty went out. You yeah. know, a year, two years, it, it, two years, but it was a year and a half, two years into the end of the TV, and it, it stopped working. It's like a year and a half, really. It's like yeah. then they just they don't they don't. It's sometimes they just don't even really care. It's like go just go buy another one. Yeah, that's that's common. That's yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Fred. And um, now while we were uh, discussing Fred's uh, Chromebook, we. Um, we saw in the chat that uh, Becca and Susan were, were chatting about um, repairing a zipper. So uh, Becca, are you, do you want to uh, catch us up on, on what that discussion was about? Oh, sure, I definitely can. Um, I, Susan just had a quick question about um, a plastic zipper being stuck. Um, and in the past, I've always unstuck that by um, rubbing some regular old bar soap, ivory soap, that kind of thing on those zipper tines. Um, and wiggling that zipper. Another good option um, would be pencil lead. Um, and I did a little reading online and some people use petroleum jelly. Uh, some people use Windex uh, or chapstick. So there's a few different options. The goal though is to have that lubrication um, and that paraffin usually is what kind of soothes that um, frustration for the plastic. Okay, thanks for catching us up. Yeah, that's, and um, Susan, if, uh... If you have other questions or you'd like to, to join the call, let us know. Um, you can always just raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring you in. Um, and so uh, does anyone else have uh, any um, repair questions for our coaches? No. So we do have- um, I have a question. I have a question yeah. of my own, um, if anyone, anyone else has one. So I'm working on this pencil sharpener I love old pencil sharpeners. So I've got to the point now where I've got the, the um, this is the mechanism that actually cuts the pencil and these wheels spin and one of them spins and one of them stuck. And what it is, is, is these actually are long, really long screws that hold these wheels in. So what's happened, it looks like, is that the screw is actually wedged inside of this cutting wheel. So I, when I turn it, the whole thing turns. And I'm trying to figure out how to get how to get that loosened up. And I tried putting some um, liquid wrench in there, but it, it doesn't seem to be budging. And unfortunately, 
it looks like someone's tried working on this before and, and the, the screw slot is a, little, is a little messed up. So it's not <clears throat> in the best condition, but I'd like, to, I'd like to, get, to fix it. Can you hold that up in front of the camera? And, uh, and so where is the, uh, the screw that it pivots on? The there screws are on the end here. So this one, this one over here turns. Oh, you see this one, you don't see the screw head turning when I turn that one. Right. When I turn the other one, everything turns. So basically as it's turning, it hits the point to where it won't go in anymore and it stops. So it's kind of stuck. So somewhere this, this shaft is fused somewhere inside of the, <clears throat> inside of the blade. I anybody, thought of somebody. Anybody have suggestions for Tom on, uh, on that one? Try feeding the screw head with a soldering iron, maybe? Okay. Is it all steel at this point now, or is there uh, plastic components? This is all metal. This is a real pencil sharpener. Yeah. Um, this is a real Boston. I mean, look, look at this sucker. Look at this, look at this case here. Another option for applying heat might be a plumber's torch. That's true. Go. Actually, but I also have a little, um, I have a butane powered soldering iron, and I could use that yeah. to heat it up. I love these old pencil sharpeners. I mean, they're just really beautifully made. And I, I fixed a couple of them, but this one's give me a, give me, give me a time. So. I see uh, Dennis is raised. Have you tried taking both of the cutters off? Hmm? Have you tried taking the cutters out? I can't take the cutter out. It is the shaft. The shaft that goes through it, you normally would unscrew. It's a really long screw. The, shaft, the screw is actually stuck onto the cutter blade. Okay. So, so that's, I, that, that's not that old then. Okay. The, re the really old ones, the shaft goes through, through it, and the screw goes all the way through a hollow. I can't see how old it is by looking at it, but I well, thought it was very similar to that. I took the other one apart. Oh, yeah, it's that, that's how it is. I'll, I'll take the other one out and show you what it looks like. It's just a really long... Um, really long screw that goes through the hollow body that's the cutter is and if you take the long screw out that uh, cutting wheel there you that's it there's the screw yes it's just so a really long screw and it threads into the back of the frame and then it goes right into the blade which there is hollow so, yeah. that's, this, this is the one that's not stuck <laughs> one of them one of them is not stuck and one of them is stuck so it's just the other one i'm dealing with a screw out yeah yeah, so maybe some penetrating oil and, and heat. And then uh, Dennis, um, raise his hand. Dennis, do you have uh, a contribution on this one? I have a thought. So uh, usually I have a, I have a drill that, I, that has, a, a torque, it has torque settings for mm -hmm. things like in the threaded fasteners. So I would suggest some kind of an impact type of action where oh. you wedge it, get a little piece of wood to wedge in the cutting blade so you don't have to hold it with your fingers and risk right. sharpening your finger and uh then try using the you know just start off really light and kind of sure. work your way out you know impact makes all the difference in, in many cases of when you have frozen bolts right you want to you want to jerk it yeah because it's where it's into the back of the frame right not into the cutting wheel itself oh no the cutting wheel is hollow yeah so it and it's just a really long screw that screws in down here at the bottom and yeah. that's loose the bottom is loose because i can i can actually move it about a quarter turn Mm. It's just that the, the screw is stuck to the, to the cutter. Mm. You can't take that screw and back it out. Yeah, that's the trouble. I've tried taking it out and, and I can't, and I, I'm, with, with the amount of force I'm having to apply to get it loose, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to, to, to mess up the, the slot. Think impact on, the back, on, the, on the back side of the frame that that screw is spread it into. Yeah, yeah. Is the the far side of that screw is it peened over? Look at the screw on the back side, not the not the end that you put the screwdriver in, but the other end of the screw. Yeah. Can you see it? You mean this end right? No. I'm no just like hold, hold up the uh, the uh, the unit. Now the yeah. other end. Uh -huh. Uh, okay, yeah. no. Nope. You can't That's see the not, end of the screw. Uh, oh, you, you the, see the end is, is not visible. What I would 
to is definitely what you I think we're talking about trying to heat up the carriage that the screw goes into. Right. Expand that metal a bit. It's not a real high grade metal. Right. The thermal expansion differential between the two metals is probably going to help you out a little bit. I'm not a registered metallurgist, sure. but there's going to be uh, a better grade of metal in the screw oh, than yeah. that carriage. Right. So hopefully you'll get the expansion differential and that'll break it loose. That if you can get that uh, screw out of the uh, carriage that holds the uh, cutter wheel, right? You'll probably find something stuck in that cutter wheel. Yeah. So here, here's I'm actually taking it out again, and if you if I here's the screw, and here and if I can I can spin this, and this is the problem with the one that's in is that is that it's not where it goes into the other metal. It's where it's the actual friction inside there's something inside there right exactly yeah you gotta get that screw out heating, heating it up could, could get it just enough to where it would come loose yeah you gotta get that whole screw out of that yoke or that assembly mm -hmm. so you can find out what's in there yeah okay thanks all right thank you tom um does uh any of our other coaches like to uh, present a, a project of theirs or we have um, we have one of our guests, um, and uh, let's see, John, are you there? I'm here. I don't know if you can. My camera is not working, but um, anyway, I, can, I, I uh, tell, well I tell us about tell us about your project, uh, John, and then we can. Uh, I'm just trying to fix my. I have a Black and Decker um, paper shutter, that's very oddly shaped and kind of cool and worth saving. And so I've been told to throw it out by many people because the it's very complicated fixing these things with the teeth and the way that they lie. And I don't know what got it off track. Uh, I've oiled it. It still turns on. The electrical's working, but the gear the gears aren't turning. Okay. So do you uh, do you have it there with you? Would you like to show it to us on video? I do. I don't know how to show it to you on video though. Can I you? Can, um... Yeah, so uh, the way the webinar format works is um, all of our guests, their video is turned off. I have to turn it on. And okay. It'll, it'll it. cause the, the software to have a little hiccup, but you'll be back with us in just a moment, so sit tight. Okay. And, um, and I know we've seen a lot of uh, uh, paper shredders at Repair Cafe over the years. Oh, so, um, so there we go. So there's the, there's the, okay. So let me take off my okay. green screen. Yes, yeah, please do. Cause, um, Are you in Iceland? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> My next slide. <laughs> uh, choose virtual none. There we go. <laughs> this is me. Okay, so this is this is the Black and Decker. Oh wow, it's weird, isn't it? Ooh, it's that's, that's a paper yeah. shredder. It's a paper shredder. I got it secondhand. It's worked for years, years, and I'm just anyway. So <laughs> it's like, it's like a paper shredder, coffee maker. Popcorn topper. So this whole thing, yeah, holds a ton of paper. This is like, I can imagine. It's one of the better ones that I've ever had. It, it's so odd. And so, um, but see, the power up here does go on. Not right now, but it usually. I've I've oiled it, and I haven't turned it on since I oiled it, and now it's not turning on. You ever, have you ever taken it apart? I have it. So that's another quagmire. So, okay, so this button down here allows me to, this, this not only takes off the power. Okay, this is hard. I'm doing it with my, hold on one second. I got to put my laptop on it and then I'm going to guide you after the laptop is steady. Uh, I, I've never seen one of those before. It's... So, okay, so this little knob down here okay. turns off electrical. Okay. And also the, all the functions of the, the rotors inside. Somehow this is like the major brake switch, right? And so we open this up and they are very deep, tiny screws in here. Yeah. And here, and I've gotten 
one or two out, I think these two. Okay. And that's as far as I've gotten because they're not easy. And this is what it looks like in the cylinder. Yeah. Um, it's basically, I'll show you, I just can, I can put my hand all the way up. Um, hold on, wait a second. Um, do you still have it plugged in? Yes, but it's, it oh, won't turn Yeah, on. please unplug it before you put it in. <laughs> I'm, I'm very confident. So, <laughs> um, but it, even if it did, it wouldn't hurt my fingers because the gears are all in here. And this is always left empty to empty down into the chute, right? Yeah, so, so that's where the paper comes out. Yeah, you would never injure yourself by putting your hand in there. So um, it's just not the kind of television I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> I, could, I, could, I, I could probably without knowing and the way I'm doing it, it looks like a, a total hazard. Yeah, I know. So um, so it's unplugged anyway. But there's so th so the power switch goes into like this little plastic <laughs> plastic <laughs> compartment here. Sure. Basically, it's a, it's a like a dead what well, I'm going to call it a dead man switch. That's a bad term to use. But it's basically it keeps it from working unless that switch is pushed. Right, it's right. A interlock. Right, and so it's been oiled. It's oily now, which is why it just slipped out of my hands. And uh, I guess I have to get, I have to work really hard at getting these other yeah they may be secure out, but I don't know if that will resolve the problem of removing the case. I I because there's two down here as well. Yeah. I don't know if it'll fully unlock it is what I'm saying. So uh, well, I th I th my guess is you'll you'll probably get to you'll probably be able to get in to see what's going on. Is there a seam that runs down the side there? Uh yes. Here. I would I would say that would probably you know and their here. chances are pretty good. Okay. You just want to make sure that those screws they're not like security screws, and if they are, you'll need to get special screwdriver tips to get the screws out. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they're. Like very, a, I mean, I can see. I mean, they're pr they're pretty much like an inch in. Okay. underneath this you know sure. in inside the capsule right and there there i just need a very long screwdriver um i think so, i was borrowing it and i had to return it so i've got to go buy something really thin and long right to fit in there and just keep working at it because they're not easy to align with the head of the of the phillips yeah and and work out i mean it really takes a lot of effort i'm just sitting there and i'm not you know and and to find up something power to do that would probably be not, not impossible but it's hard to find you know sure. so that's where i'm stuck you, i mean you, you did get, get the screws out is that right i got two out okay so but i would I think just they were take, loose take so one of those with you to the hardware <laughs> so store. i kept like toggling around because there's six there and i wanted to see which one you know would come out easiest and so two of them did but the other ones i i'm not making any you know i i think i right. spent probably three hours getting the two out so now, now with if they're stuck which you can sometimes do if you know that the head is fitting you can yeah. jerk the screwdriver rather than just totally turning it because sometimes you're jerking it will get it to pop loose if it's stuck so like more this action versus more rotation more rotation also, sometimes you can tighten it more and that yeah. will pop it loose. So try to tighten it and then loosen it. Okay. Does that this, make sense? It, this way and then I'm going to be... You're going to tighten it a little bit yeah. and then loosen okay. it. It's like Got it's it. stuck if it's stuck. Or back and forth a little. But once something. you get it loose, it's going to come out. But basically, it. it's, getting it, it's getting it unstuck. But I, I just make sure you, if you have the screw, you, you know what kind of screwdriver you need to get. Right. And you'll get something like, like this with as a... You can't see, yeah, there's got I a- can see, yeah, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, it was just thin, it was very thin. It fit in there just well enough. I would go to like um, Lowe's or something. If it's just a regular screwdriver, they have a pretty, pretty inexpensive sets of screwdrivers with long shafts that you could use to get in there. A few, okay. maybe eight Anything or nine bucks. Any power that you can think of, like attachments that- Any what? Could, that might loosen well, it you, better like, and, and make this hole faster, like just, you know. You want to be careful not to strip the head of the screw. So using a power screwdriver would potentially, you know, spin rather than unscrew the screw. And they're and really small. Round out the threads. Yeah, and then and you'll never get it. Then you have to drill it out to get right. it out. And I've had to do that, and it's so fun. Um, but I'm trying to like to end up destroying this in order to fix it. No, <laughs> you won't. Well, it's not working, right? Well, right. I mean, so it's already not working. You could right? turn it into a planner. I, yeah. This would this has this kind of a lot of uses. I mean, this is, or it could be the first. <laughs> or it could be be the first stage of a rocket too. <laughs> I, totally, <laughs> I like a rocket better. Let's do that. So yeah. In our uh, in our chat, some of our guests have made a few suggestions. Um, Peter had 
looked quickly at the reviews on Amazon and saw that a lot of folks complain of the overload sensor, that is the one that detects how much paper you put in all at once. Right. And that may be um, something that's faulty in these units. So when you do get it open, that might be something to examine. Um, of course, we want to caution you that when you do have it open, anything you do to cause it to run while it's open could ex expose you to the blades. And so of course, you know. Electricity, you yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how did it stop working? Did it just, just... It, 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 it had hiccups over the years a lot, and I never thought much of it because, you know, things get stuck. But I, I'm really pretty mindful of not putting more than six sheets or so in at a time. And allegedly, this will take like eight or 12. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty solid. And so this sure. is not like your average run-of-the-mill shredder. So, oh. I, uh, so I just was putting it in, and I actually it was like, I think it was three sheets the last time I did it, and it just died. It quit. I would suspect it's something like a switch, because if it was something where you were jamming it up, or, it was, or the blades were getting worse, it would probably get gradually get worse and worse and worse, and then it would stop. But right. you were just using it, and then it suddenly no, stopped. It was, it was normal prior to it just right. completely stopping. So I would say find find the switch. You can find the switch, and at least temporarily, to test it, to bypass it, just to test to see if that's what's causing it, and then you can you can go from there and decide what you want to do. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think it's worth going in there and, and open. You know, it's a, it's such a cool looking thing. You never you'll never find another one. I, I mean that. That's part of the why I don't want to give up, I guess. And so there's nothing wrong with that. It was a good. I'm gl I'm glad to be chatting about it. This is yeah. So we're we're looking at some good notes here. I'm taking screenshots of all this vise grips and and clamps and and so the overload sensor. I probably need a little tutoring on that the next time we meet. <laughs> that would be uh, yeah. I don't even know where that would be. Is that actually inside the the bottom container or is it? In the no, every all the intelligence and the function is here, and and only on the front side where the switch is. Yeah. So this whole side is baked. It's just empty plastic to get the paper to go down. Sure. And part of the. It's part of a functional design flaw. I mean, they wanted to be innovative and they did a great job. It's a cool paper shredder, but it goes against gravity. You're going in, a, you're going you know, horizontal and then you expect the paper to go down and it gets jammed up a little bit every time over the years. But it, so I imagine when I put the paper in this last time that it came back into mm. the blades and maybe it could be a sensor just failed or maybe, yeah. I don't know. I think it's worth getting an inexpensive set of screwdrivers and, and getting it open. Okay. You don't have to worry about returning. And then, you know, you'll, screwdrivers like this are always really useful with really no, long. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. You'll, yeah. you'll find something else that you can use it for. So I'll spend, I mean, five to $15 on a screwdriver versus I would, on I would definitely get, I would definitely at least get a screwdriver. It's worth it for stuff. Yeah. For stuff like that, that's like, you know, you're never going to find another one like it again. It's kind of cool. So. Fair enough. That's my that's my whole point of being here. Yeah. <laughs> so where are you calling in from? Boulder. Boulder. I've yeah. been to Boulder. Boulder's lovely. I went to one of your clinics about oh god here about months ago before the pandemic, like January. Uh, I want to okay. say sure. And I had a clock that we fixed, but it's having issues again. Too. <laughs> but we did fix it, and they gave me a new battery too, which is really g generous of them. So. But I had a good time, and I felt like they handled it, so I thought I'd try you again. So, yeah, we're glad you yeah. called in tonight, John. And, That's uh, fine. I, I like yeah. interesting stuff. Where, where are all of you? Well, most of us are in North Carolina, um, and then we've got Dave is calling in from uh, Schenectady, New York. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're, we often have a group of coaches from everywhere, and then uh, folks dial in. I, I know next month we're going to see people in from Australia. Um, we last month we had somebody in from the UK, so uh, wow. we we get folks joining us from all over. So this is a global you fix it organization. It it is. There are um, something over two thousand chapters of Repair Cafe around the world. They're all wow. locally organized and managed. So while there is a headquarters in Amsterdam um, that you know promotes the brand and promotes the idea, um, yeah. each individual group runs their own. So. Most of us here are um, work together in um, central North Carolina, the Raleigh-Durham area. Okay. And then, um, the more liberal of the sides. 
Yes. I get. Well, no, Asheville's pretty liberal too. Asheville, Asheville's our liberal city. Yeah. <laughs> every every yeah. every state has one. I have Asheville friends there. Asheville has a drum circle. <laughs> <laughs> I the, have a friend. I have a friend in Shelby too, who is a, has a tough job. He's a counselor, but um, yeah. Asheville is really really nice. I was there two weeks ago, so yeah, that's really. And nice. I have some. I'm finishing my doctorate this uh, week actually coming up. Um, Congratulations. I know what that's like. I have a friend who's getting his doctorate. I have had my eyes burned out on Zoom for about 60 to 80 hours a week since uh, New Year's Day this year, basically. I've been on the screen doing this stuff, which is why I probably sound agitated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like I'm constantly defending my thoughts, you know, about medicine and everything else and suggestions and alternative ways of doing things. And So, so what's your, what are you getting your PhD in? It's a doc, it's a clinical doctorate in uh, acupuncture. Oh, so, wonderful! Very yeah, interesting. I was licensed uh, in two thousand nine, so I've been uh, practicing for eleven years. And uh, one of my clients at, was very generous in Boulder. I said, "I look, I think I'm going to take a little time off, and I'm going to go get my clinical doctorate." And he said, "Why don't I help you?" And I said, "Only in Boulder." <laughs> you know, so like. <laughs> All right, John. Well, thank hey. you very much for calling in tonight. And we're going to take another question from another okay. one of our guests. I hope so, to see you the next time. All right. Good luck thanks, with that. Thanks for, thanks thank for calling for in. Help. Sure. Okay. And we have um, uh, Fred has raised his hand. Let's see. Uh, Fred, are you there? Oh, uh, there you go. And uh, I, uh, when John mentioned he's from Boulder, and so am I. And I just wanted to... to um, mentioned that uh, in March, uh, Wayne Seltzer, who's the one that organizes the Boulder Fix-It Clinics, and uh, we went to virtual mode. And uh, it was, it's been amazing. And we, you know, last Sunday we had one, we had somebody join us from Australia, we had people join us from Sweden, the UK, France, as well as both <laughs> coasts. And I've been really impressed as a teacher uh, you're told to keep your hands off the student's stuff, like their keypad or the workpiece. And the virtual clinic is definitely a way of reinforcing that technique. But I've been just so amazed at how well we've been able to help people in a virtual mode fix stuff. So for those of you that are uh, the listeners who have stuff they want to fix, um, those clinics are really effective. And I know there are a lot of them now, but... Um, I'm just really uh, pleased to be part of that and to see how effective they are. And I hope when COVID finally gets settled, if it ever does, although I got my doubts about that, that we still continue the virtual mode because it really offers a lot of opportunity we just didn't even think about before. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of folks who are in places where um, they can't easily get to a repair cafe event, um, rural parts of the country where uh, these kinds of virtual events may be a great way to reach them in the future. Um, and I know we've got folks in uh, other parts of the country. I see Dennis and Pico are giving us shout outs from Ellensburg, Washington. So it's great to have you guys here as well. Um, and so uh, do, if we have any other projects from our panelists or guests, otherwise we're probably gonna start wrapping it up. Um, so if, we have, uh, if you have any other questions for our, get, for our coaches, please go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise I will, uh, give a, a plug for our upcoming events. You can always uh, visit repaircafenc.org. That's um, our local group in North Carolina or repaircafe.tv where we try to keep an updated listing of future virtual events like this one. Um, there are events produced by other repair organizations as well. And we try to give them some visibility. Um, Fix-It Clinics in particular um, has a lot of events that um, they are producing across the US and around the world. And so, um, we want to thank uh, everybody for being here this evening. Thank you to our coaches for their contributions, and especially to Tom for his demonstration of case cracking. I think it was great. And, um, and so our next event is coming up on August 3rd, where uh, Becca and Cheryl, who are uh, on screen with us, they will be uh, discussing sewing machines and how to clean and maintain sewing machines to keep them humming. I know I always am rather in intimidated by the complexity of a sewing machine, but I think they're going to make it a lot simpler for us. So, um, all right. I think that'll be about it. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank and you. I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Yep. All right. Good night. Night. Bye. Bye.